Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jessica Zavala, and I am delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Ohio Program for Campus Safety and Mental Health to today's webinar. As many of you know, September is nationally recognized as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, and we are honored to kick off our 2021-22 webinar series, Promoting Hope and Resilience in Suicide Loss Survivors with the presentation, What It Is Like to Lose Someone to Suicide. Before I introduce today's presenter, I do have a few brief announcements to share. First, CME CEU credits are available. Uh, the activity code for today's session is 50 MELT. That's 50, M as in Mary, E as in Edward, uh, L as in Larry, and T as in Triangle. Uh, this code will expire on September 24th at 1 p.m. Please be on the lookout for information periodically posted via the chat function regarding how to obtain credits. Also, thank you to those who participated in our inaugural Twitter campus community chat, building the conversation on mental wellness in which we partnered with NAMI Ohio and uh, various, not various, excuse me, NAMI on campus champ chapters. Our next campus community chat will be held on October 21st at 2 p.m. We will partner with the Ohio State University Higher Education Center for Alcohol and drug misuse prevention and recovery and various collegiate recovery programs to chat about support and recovery initiatives for the campus community. Um, please be on the lookout for additional details via our listserv. And we also invite you to visit our, our website as well as follow us on our social media sites for details. Next on October 16th, NAMI Walks Your Way Summit County will be hosting an in-person or a virtual event um, if you're interested in participating in that walk here in Summit County, um, details also will be posted um, in the chat for that. Uh, we do encourage you to share your comments and feedback regarding today's presentation. Um, please feel free to, to post in the Q&A or chat function. There will also be a few minutes at the end for, for questions for today. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and the video will be made available via our YouTube channel um, regarding um, today's presentation. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. Rebecca Prather is a licensed independent social worker with supervision vision designation who received her bachelor's and master's degrees in social work from the University of Akron. At Akron Children's Hospital, Rebecca works on the Pediatric Behavioral Health Unit, and she is also the co-vice chair of the Summit County Suicide Prevention Coalition. Rebecca works closely with various Akron-based agencies and nonprofit organizations to bridge gaps between what needs to be and what is currently. She has presented on various topics, including a panel discussion for continuing education credits geared toward how to implement trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy to clients in poverty, violence in schools, and self-care for professionals. She has been closely involved with the National Association of Social Workers Ohio chapter, serving as regional director on the board of directors since 2019. Participants in today's session will gain knowledge of the impact of suicide on loved ones and others, post-traumatic growth, and determining how to, to assist suicide loss survivors. So without further ado, I present Rebecca Prather. Rebecca? Thank you so much, Jessica. I'm very Honored to be here, humbled with all of you. I see some familiar names as attendees, so I'm excited to see some familiar names and also very excited to try to connect with some of you that I have not had the chance and pleasure yet. Um, so yes, we're here during Suicide Prevention Month. I'm very glad that you, know, you all are here to join me. Um, the next slide would be what we're gonna talk about first. I know that in the initial slides, we 
had a disclaimer in a sense that if you need to step away, please do so. I just want to reiterate that suicide prevention and postvention are topics that are very important to have conversations around, but at the same time, they are also very difficult and can also hit home for a lot of individuals. So if you do need to find time for yourself during the presentation, please don't hesitate to do so. No one will look at you differently whatsoever. Regarding other disclaimers, disclosures, another one I like to bring out because people make an assumption about this sometimes. I am not personally a suicide loss survivor. And just for those of you that aren't aware of what that is, of course, that's somebody who has lost somebody uh, from a death by suicide. So I don't personally fit into that category, but I have people in my personal life and also in the professional realm that I've worked with that are suicide loss survivors. And those have been my inspiration for continuing these. Also wanna point out that other individuals that are attendees here can very well be suicide loss survivors. We'll get into it during the statistics, but suicide affects a lot of people every year. So statistically speaking, there's at least a few in the room, the virtual room at the moment. So please be respectful of that. Just as if we're, you know, there's individuals here that provide therapy services, services that have HIPAA requirements, confidentiality will apply here. If there so happens to be something that's in the chat that is more sensitive and somebody being vulnerable with their personal professional life, I would hope that you guys abide to the same standard of confidentiality and respecting others that we do in our professional relationships. I also would just like to say, um, I'm not entirely an expert. I do feel like sometimes people feel that I am an expert and maybe I am and I'm just being humble but I don't like to pretend that I know everything. Sometimes I'll actually even open it up to the crowd because if I feel like every time I do these presentations, whether it's a one hour one or a four hour one, I feel like I always get something new out of them myself. So please don't hesitate to chime in with any input that you have as well. And you guys will also figure out, I am not a um, extrovert. I'm actually an introvert and I just believe in doing things that make you grow out of your comfort zone. So being here today is one of those examples. I do hope that this is an interactive webinar. There's parts where I do ask you to put things in the chat. And actually the first thing that I'm gonna start with actually right now, if you guys have a moment, is putting in the chat either where you work or what you do, what your role is in your professional realm of things. I know we have the opportunity to have a broad audience scope here. So if you had a moment to just put in the chat, something along those lines so I can share with everybody else and talk through that. And then as they mentioned, while you guys are putting those in the chat, we'll have a Q&A section at the end and I may not get to all the material that's in the PowerPoint today, but that's okay because you'll have access to the PowerPoint. Um, but I would rather have more than not enough and I'll make sure to watch time so that we do have questions at the end. But if something does come up that you feel like you'd like to talk about during the presentation, please don't hesitate to put that in the chat too, and we'll make sure we get to it. So as Abby is going to the next slide, we'll start looking at some of these um, places that people are working and doing. So we have college counselor, another counselor also at a college, director of student counseling services, um, somebody from University of Dayton, mental health counselor at another college in New York, welcome. Um, mental health counselor, accessibility counselor, coordinator for mental well-being, that's an interesting title. Uh, college disability services coordinator, general counselor at California Community College, welcome. I like to know that there are people from out of state too, that's always good to know when I'm doing this presentation. Let's see, prevention education coordinator, mental health counselor at a college. Ah, a senior BSW student. Please know I love to connect with students. I literally love to connect with anybody, but especially students. If you want anybody to run things by, please don't hesitate to reach out. An MSC student, very good. Some individuals from Neomed, director of student help, CEO and founder of Light After Loss Suicide Loss Survivor. I talk about you in my resource list that everybody gets. I'm very pleasured to have you here. Um, school social worker. Hi, Andrew, you're familiar to me. Um, 
program manager for mental health and student safety, mental health counselor. So it seems like, oh, another person from Light After Loss, wonderful. Then I'll explain toward the end essentially what that is. Um, Alicia, nice to see you again. So yes, okay, there's somebody from criminal justice too, so good to know. Okay, so just getting an idea from my sense, you know, who our audience is, mainly it seems like higher education was what we expected when we were discussing this presentation and what it would look like. Um, and also some different counselors and different capacities, whether it's schools and community mental health. So I'll make sure to keep that in mind. So our objectives today, looking at, you know, just making sure everybody has a general understanding of what a suicide loss survivor is, how they're impacted, talking about what we what somebody might consider a quote unquote normal reaction, talking about post-traumatic growth, which I feel like is um, the biggest takeaway from this presentation, the canyon of why, and then of course, how anybody in any capacity, whether you're a professional or you're working with somebody in your or your personal life as a suicide loss survivor, how you can support them and be there for them. Okay. Another chat question here. Put in the chat what the first word that comes to your mind is when you hear somebody say suicide. And Abby, while we're waiting for them to put some things in the chat, why don't you skip to the next slide there? So I like to share this. I've done this presentation multiple times in many different capacities. One time with uh, in school staff, none of them of which were actual in the counseling realm. They were actually just school staff, which was wonderful and I'd love to do again. Other times with community mental health agencies, other times at the hospital where you reach different professionals at the hospital setting, whether that's nursing, chaplaincy, uh, things of that sort. I like to do this. So the Second to last time I've done this in person, I did have these notes. In a sense, this was my in-person activity. Instead of using the chat, I would use the post-it notes to discuss and share what people were thinking around all these different topics and questions that I have. So these are some of the examples that individuals put on their post-it notes around the wall as far as what the first word that came to their mind um, when they hear the word suicide. So sometimes I get some new ones um, and sometimes I get a lot of repeats, which is of course normal too. Um, so the hopeless comes up quite a bit, heartbreaking, sad, pain, prevention, prevention. I like that pain, gut wrenching. Okay. Gut wrenching I think is actually a new one as well. So let's see. So Jessica, I don't know, did you see that there was a question that needed to be answered? Actually, it was just the attendee post in their location. Okay, thank you. All right, so Abby, if you wanted to head to the next slide. Essentially why I do that opening activity, just to kind of lay the groundwork for, you know, what's to come. Again, reminding everybody to take a break if they need it. This video that we're going to watch, it, I'll set the groundwork. It's a video that is pretty sensitive. It deals the initial reactions when somebody becomes a suicide loss survivor, some of the thought processes that go through heads. Um, I would say about the last 20 minutes or so, Abby, or 20 seconds or so, Abby, are not part of the video. It's just them doing an advertisement. So be on the mind, watch for that. Um, and just as a heads up, I believe they're British accent, so don't let the three off or subtitle, so that helps as well. But every time I do this presentation, I do go and do a thorough search for different videos that can, in a sense, depict this as well. And I feel like I never find one that's concise as this one, as short as this one is, and gets the point across. So I continue to use the same video. So Abby, if you want to go ahead. I don't understand why people don't talk about it. I'm not ashamed that my daughter chose that way to not be here. I'm grief stricken that she's not with me.
I'd left my phone in my room and I had 45 missed calls and I felt powerless. It was so shocking and so unbelievable, but also before I'd even taken the call, my phone lit up and I knew what the call was about. I woke up the next morning to two policemen banging on my bed bedroom window. So I let them inside and they sat me down and they told me that my sister had been found. I wanted to double check everything, that every, the, the right name came up. The police sergeant started talking to me and as soon as he started talking to me, it was just like my heart had ripped in two. It wasn't until quite a, a bit of time afterwards that the dust began to settle and you kind of realise what's happened. Physical feeling of going, not, no, that's my daughter. My daughter is gone. I got to a point on Jared's birthday where I was worried about myself. I felt like going to join her. All the, the first, the first birthday, the first New Year's, <clears throat> the first Christmas, it all just hits you when you least expect it. My heart's never felt the same. It was a physical feeling of having a part of me taken away. I developed agoraphobia, I developed severe anxiety and um, general anxiety disorder. I developed uh, depression worse than I ever have in my entire life. Comes and goes in waves of feeling from sadness to, yeah, just, just of course missing her. If you can just imagine one night where you've stayed up crying or crying yourself to sleep over someone that's broken your heart, every single time that's happened, all at once. And the feeling's never really gone away. It broke my heart. I think the biggest thing that I've taken from this experience is the sort of fragility of, of, of life. Um, particularly when it comes to mental ill health and not having services around you. That um, mental health is not a weakness. People to this day are still sweeping this under the rug. People are still not talking about it. People are still pretending it's not happening. There's nothing wrong about um, that speaking out. There's nothing wrong with having a cry. There's nothing wrong with having a hug. And it's not weak to speak. So I think dialogue is the key. I think conversation is the key. I think asking your friends if they're okay and then listening is the key. It's really made me realise how important it is to reach out to any loved ones, to um, talk about things more, express feelings and, and just be there for each other. My entire baseline of who I am has changed. She was my only sibling, so she was my best friend for 20 odd years. I, I feel like I'm not the same person as I was and I think a lot of people expect you to kind of bounce back to become the same person but I'm never going to be them again. My whole experience of life has changed. I don't think it's ever going to be normal for me. And if this reaches just one person who was just like me, I just want them to know that they're, they're not alone. You're not thinking about what you leave behind but the aftermath just goes on forever look after yourselves, look after each other, and life's really short, just enjoy it. So good video in a sense, it gives you a good idea in a nutshell of some of those initial thoughts and then also kind of their takeaways from the experience and what other people can be doing in themselves in the future. So what are your thoughts after viewing the video and what do you think, you know, somebody that's a suicide loss survivor could ask somebody that they lost to suicide if they had another chance per se to do so. You can put some of those thoughts in the chat as we move on to the next slide. Okay, so suicide impact, of course, a little bit of statistics for you all. Of course, on the right hand side, the suicide loss survivor official definition is over there. But for those of you that don't know, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death across all age groups you know, individuals that are between the ages of 15 and 19 are six times more likely to die as a result of homicide or suicide um, instead of cancer, which is the leading natural cause of death in that age group. And then, you know, just looking at other statistics, populations with special considerations, we would look at, believe it or not, the Appalachian community, the African-American community, specifically African-American males, there's been a recent slight increase. And then also white middle-aged males actually have quite a high um, rate of death by suicide compared to their counterparts. Uh, Abby, if you wanna to go to the next slide there. 
And then of course I wanted to give a perspective and I also have to thank Karen who I believe is actually on the webinar for her input. Um, wanted to give an impact, a impact and perspective from higher education specifically. And I know that individuals are particularly more worried about young adults and individuals that are in higher education and what the rates of suicide, death by suicide look like for them. Interestingly enough, a young adult attending college is actually seen as a protective factor just because there are actually a lot more supports and resources that are free on campuses um, than non-student peers. So there's been a study that has shown that, so for example, seriously considered death by suicide, undergraduates were right around a 7%, so it's actually 6.6 .6 to 7.5. Undergrad and graduates combined, theirs is 7.1 to 7.7% 7 .7 seriously considered death by suicide. And then individual, and this is an age range of 18 to 22. And them not being enrolled in college full-time, their rates of seriously considered death by suicide in the study were actually 9%, so higher. So just wanted to point that out there that actually there's been multiple studies that show that it could be considered a protective factor that a young adult is attending college compared to their peers. Another a special population to think about, and it's also, you know, in a sense a risk factor, not because of who they are, but just because of the things they experience. Uh, LGBTQ youth are three to seven times more likely at risk for suicide than youth that do not identify as such. Okay. So I wanted to check here. I see that there was one question about um, what maybe somebody as a suicide loss survivor could ask that person that they lost. So what could I have done to help you? And why didn't you say something to someone? That is a very good question that I feel like is often in suicide loss survivors head in the aftermath of losing that person to death by suicide. And we'll get to that actually on the next slide. So that's wonderful. And then we also um, wanted to just point out, you know, there is no normal quote unquote reaction to um, a death by suicide and being that suicide loss survivor that's left behind. I like to put in that quote from Brene Brown over there on the left. I'm a big fan of Brene Brown and I think it just depicts what the suicide loss survivor is going through, that we run from grief because it scares us, but yet it reaches toward the grief because the broken parts want to mend. And then I see there is also a question for me specifically in the chat. It's, do you have any numbers for immigrant college student suicide? I have seen that rise in the past years. I don't have the specific, specific statistical numbers on that at the moment. What I would advise, just because I don't have it, we can connect one-on-one, -on -one, or if you actually ask the local ME's office or the local coalition that you're a part of or the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation, they are able to get you the raw statistics. And I do wanna point that out before we move on that there has been a lot in the media over the last year or so that rates of death by suicide in general have increased during the pandemic. And I'm here to tell you as a person that does analyze the statistics that that's actually not true. It's very, um, it's re remained with the average five year past average. And anecdotally that's being thought because we're all feeling like this time everybody is in this together and it is a very hard time for everybody. And as everybody's been saying during the pandemic, um, we're all in this together. So it seems that people do feel a more togetherness, more openness, able to communicate more about their feelings rather than feeling like they needed to, you know, end their life to end that pain. So I just wanted to point that out. If you do see something in the media about the rates of suicide increasing, I would challenge you to challenge that person and their sources. Um, just want to put that little plug out there. So I, in our resource guide that we give you, um, there's a few books in there and I actually have them with me. If we have time at the end, I could show you what the covers look like. But one of the ones is called The Gift a Second. It's a very short, which is helpful. And it really just describes this demographic here where, you know, 
before you experience a death by suicide, it seems like your life, quote unquote, is at a normal in a sense, also like going through the pandemic. And then you have something like a death by suicide happen in your life. You're, there's a lot of immediate emotions going up and down. And then you have a new normal life event tumulates your emotions in the moment. And then you eventually settle into the new normal. That's just this constant cyclical feeling. Okay. And this is kind of going back to that question that I believe it was Shannon put in the chat as far as, you know, what kind of things suicide loss survivors may be asking those loved ones that they've lost. There is a lot of what ifs. So what if I did this? Or also in the other way, if then, if I would have just done this, then maybe that person would still be here. Or if I went to that football game, then maybe that person wouldn't have died last night. Or if I answered my phone at three in the morning, then maybe they would be there. So us being the individual supporting them, whether it's in a professional or personal capacity, first off to acknowledge that the if thens are normal, but then to also help them come to terms with no matter what they did, um, it wouldn't have prevented something in that very moment. Um, suicide contagion, of course, is a very big concern in any sense. When somebody does die by suicide, there is a concern that there is going to be a a contagion effect where the suicide loss survivors themselves will have suicidal thoughts. So again, if you're in a personal or professional capacity with somebody that's a suicide loss survivor, we really encourage you to be mindful, look out for warning signs, which we'll kind of cover warning signs, risk factors that are showing that maybe somebody is struggling and don't hesitate to ask somebody directly if they're having thoughts of ending their life, if they're having thoughts of death by suicide, um, because statistically and research shows that directly asking somebody that does not increase or make somebody have those thoughts. You're not going to make that thought pop into their head. Um, it was already there or it wasn't and this ask is not going to make that happen. But just also thinking about in the immediate aftermath, sometimes people do have resentment like, why would you leave me like this? Or we were supposed to do this. Why would you do that? Sometimes people avoid therapy and they're therapy resistant in a sense is the clinical term, which is normal. So just making sure that if you are that professional person that you're also making sure that they have a personal support system with them and that's checking in on them as well. Sometimes people will feel shame because other people may indirectly or directly make them feel that they should have known or they could have done something specifically and of course, everybody, not everybody, but most people know the general signs of grief and just monitoring that to um, make sure that we're supporting individuals the best that we can. And so the stigma and aftermath, there's a lot of things to consider, whether you're in a personal relationship or a professional relationship with the suicide loss survivor. So thinking about what the relationship was between the two individuals, the suicide loss survivor and the person who did die by suicide. If it was a professional relationship, of course, it's going to be treated a little bit differently than a husband and wife, which again, you can't discredit the two different relationships and their different qualities because they're all serious and should be taken that way you want to try to help conceptualize or think about, you know, where was that person who is now a suicide loss survivor when they figured out about that death? Were they out for a run, if that's something that they typically would do? Or were they at work working on this thing that they work on so often? Or were they at home watching their favorite TV show? It's important to kind of notice these things because then there's an important way to think about that in the grieving process. When we have somebody who is a suicide loss survivor and they were notified of the death in a sense, then they might have a difficult time returning to that activity. And it's something to maybe encourage them to ease into over time, just not immediately jumping right back into it full force. Um, you know, some individuals, if they're a suicide loss survivor and it was their spouse or their parent, and they were all in the home and this had occurred. You know, maybe there's conversations to be had about moving into a different home, what that would look like. Another important thing in that immediate aftermath is 
we have wonderful resources in Summit County. Other counties in Ohio have these wonderful resources where there's um, not only law enforcement and of course the medical examiner responds in majority of cases or the deceased body goes to that office. Another wonderful resource is having crisis counselors respond on scene and usually law enforcement is the one who calls them in. But what they do is just provide that wonderful crisis response, that immediate counseling that's needed, that case management. Another thing that I would always encourage is whether you're a personal support or a professional support to be able to make sure that there's a designated third party person that is making phone calls to other family members, to relatives, to people in the community to notify them of the death by suicide and not that immediate family having to deal with that and reliving that trauma over and over again. Okay. And just like a lot of things in the world, um, it's important for us to validate that knowing intellectually that somebody is gone and the death was by suicide and accepting it are two entirely different things that goes to a therapeutic approach known as the wise mind. So just kind of help individuals with that piece. Another thing to kind of monitor is social media. Um, social media can be a blessing and a curse and maybe another third party person to monitor that as well. And so the scarlet letter effect, this is definitely important, especially for school-based counselors work and higher education work. So there's an example in one of the books that I have in the resources that talks about the scarlet letter, because unfortunately, as we know, there is a stigma against uh, death by suicide that we are trying to combat every single day, but it's still there. So in the book, there was a child who had lost her father to suicide over the summer and came back to school first day of school. The teacher was taking attendance for the first day where you know you do roll call and they get to her, the teacher calls her name. And you know, as she's saying that she's here, another student blurts out, oh, you're the dad who, or you're the kid whose dad killed himself this summer. So maybe considering again, if something like this were to happen and somebody is a suicide loss survivor in whatever capacity and whatever setting, how can we make sure we are preventing any type of scarlet letter effect? What can we have done in that situation where this poor kid is still grieving that people weren't going to be calling that out in the middle of the classroom, let alone using the wrong language, might I add. I would encourage everybody to stay away from killing themselves, um, also committing suicide because we commit crimes, not suicide, and resorting to what we think is the best language as you know, death by suicide. So just thinking about what you can do in your capacity to try to reduce the scarlet letter effect that it may have on the suicide loss survivor. And of course, you know, just making sure that as time goes on, trying to find that one thing that's going to make them not feel numb, whether, you know, for me, I'm a runner, so it would be, I need to, even though it's hard, get out there for a run. So for somebody to encourage me, hey, go out there for a run and get doing that today and text me when you're done. Whatever that looks like, whether it's you're, again, professional, you're supporting somebody or uh, personally, you're, professional, you're supporting somebody, figuring out that one thing that's for them. So for some people that can be sewing or baking, whatever that looks like. And even if they can't do it alone, maybe you're doing that with them. Um, just trying to then ease back into a schedule and routine over time. Kind of already hit on the social media aspect and I think it's because I'm very passionate about that and maybe finding a third party person to monitor that as well, just because unfortunately there are a lot of messages that can be put out there. Another thing for individuals that are in the higher education and even school-based settings to look out for is A, what kind of message is the organization, the university, the school, the school system, the school district, what message are they putting out there on their own social media about what happened? Are you totally dismissing it, not putting anything out there, just hoping nobody talks about it? Are you going to put something general out there? We know we lost a student. 
yesterday and we're going to have crisis counselors. What is that going to look like for you? It's definitely best practice to keep messages very vague in general to promote hope and resilience and to make resources available on campus and on school property, of course. And just recognizing that there is no right way to grieve. Some people are going to say that person's moving on too quickly, and some are going to say you're taking too long to move on. So helping validate that as well. Okay. Safe messaging guidelines and memorial special considerations, their links, and of course, with the PDF version of the PowerPoint you'll get, you'll be able to look at it. But essentially, some of the highlights are the bullet points there, making sure that there's a mobile crisis response team, making the crisis hotline call and text lines readily available, making sure you're paying attention to the anniversary of the death, not necessarily highlighting it in the public eye, but in the background, making sure you're paying attention to how that could affect the suicide loss survivors, individuals at the school, things of that sort. We also, 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 also really like to hone in on the fact that we, nobody is recommending at this point having a permanent memorial about a death by suicide. We would rather encourage like a walk effort to, against, you know, for suicide prevention and awareness. Just because the rationale behind that is we don't want to continually remind individuals, A, that there was a death by suicide and that's very sad. And also B, we don't want to increase the likelihood of a suicide contagion or somebody thinking, oh, we're glorifying this death. So now maybe if I do that, I'll also be glorified. So just being mindful of that. So the one year anniversary of the death by suicide, you know, you just need to make sure that people are together and not be alone. And then this is where it gets interesting, to, in my opinion. Um, if you're having a complicated bereavement, complicated um, grief process, <clears throat> your symptoms of grief will intensify. Grief can be seen as frightful, shameful, or strange. Some people feel like the longing for their own life to be over is the only part of the relationship they have left with that loved one that has died by suicide. Another thing to watch out for and you can support for is knowing that memories and traditions are gonna be going on without that person and how will that affect those suicide loss survivors. And then also to be on the know of, it's always good to know that the second year, believe it or not, is harder than the first year after a death by suicide. And the last time I did this presentation, somebody pointed out to me, those never go away. You're always gonna have those moments. 20 years will pass and something's gonna happen. So for example, for this person, the person that died by suicide always made sure that the family seen 4th of July fireworks. So every single year still over 20 years later, when they go and see 4th of July fireworks, they're tearing up because you know they're having those memories. But just thinking about that, the second year is harder than the first, just because that's typically when your supports actually stop reaching out and think that you're fine. Another story I like to tell as we can slip to the next slide is the first time that I was going through, you know, being that support for somebody in my personal life, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, so I was actually reading a book for when I was starting these presentations several years ago. And that was actually the life after second or life after suicide book. And <clears throat> she experienced the loss of a family member. And I was like, what the heck do I do here? I should know this. Um, typically, and you hear this sometimes just in general, when somebody's experiencing something difficult, they're going through a very rough time. And this applies here. When everybody says, I'm here for you, whatever you need. And then they respond, okay, thanks. You're like, oh, well, that's nothing. And then you don't hear anything. You absolutely need to reach out to them with something very concrete that you are asking of them to do. So 
I reached out to her and I said, you know what, next week on this day, we're going to go for an hour coffee date at this place. And she said, okay, she met me there. We talked. And then she texted me the next day and she said, that's the absolute best thing that you've done for me. And if you wouldn't have reached out, I wouldn't have ever met anybody for coffee. And that's exactly what I needed. So just keep that in mind when you're really supporting those individuals that are suicide loss survivors. Have you want to go back to the post-traumatic growth? That's one of the big things that is a big takeaway for people, this uh, concept of post-traumatic growth. So if you look at that picture on the slide of post-traumatic growth, um, where Abby was, <laughs> now we're slipping all over the place, um, that one, yes. You see kind of toward the bottom of the screen, in a sense, every, all the water is in one area, right? And as time goes on and the water flows, it technically goes out in the fork of the road there. So the concept of post-traumatic growth is a wonderful thing. And this is exactly what I want everybody to take away from this presentation is as time goes on, as you're helping, supporting, you know, suicide loss survivors, I really want you to think about how you can validate what they're feeling in the moment, but also how you can encourage them to move along and give back. So post-traumatic growth, you're in this fork in the road. One side that you know, you can flow to, in a sense, going down the river is your post-traumatic stress disorder, as we're very familiar with in complicated bereavement, where you're stuck in this rut, you're constantly yearning for the loss of the loved one and trying to be with them again, and you, you just go down that side. Post-traumatic growth would be the other side. You flow toward giving back to the community. You start a walk for suicide awareness and prevention. You end up giving talks as a suicide loss survivor, which those are out there. There's quite a few TED Talks that are an hour long or so where it's suicide loss survivors themselves giving talks. You start a local support group for suicide loss survivors, which is absolutely wonderful. You write books. Um, four of these books, I believe, are actually from personal suicide loss survivor stories. So whatever you can do, to help promote that hope and resilience in that person rather than them going down the other side of the fork. <clears throat> okay, Abby. And then of course, as we're trying to shift the paradigm, your change of perspective, there's gonna be gifts in this. What matters and what doesn't? And how does this bring us together? You know, suicide or death by suicide can really bring a community, it can bring a family more close together. And how are we going to give back based on this unfortunate experience that we've been through? Okay, and our processes is actually a very familiar therapeutic style whenever you have a loss. And they tailored it specifically to death by suicide for suicide loss survivors. You have to make sure that they're recognizing the loss, reacting to that separation and that immediate aftermath, which is fine. You know, recollecting and re-experiencing the deceased, the memories, relinquishing old attachments to the deceased is a hard one and it does need a lot of professional and personal support. So that can mean, again, going back to moving to a different living situation, it can go to, okay, we're going to clean their desk or, okay, we're going to remove clothes out of their closet. What's that gonna look like for you? Um, and whatever personal professional supports can be by their side during those processes because it is difficult to do alone. Readjust, so kind of going back to what does that new normal look like for you? What's gonna be different? And then six is the reinvest in a sense, also known as post-traumatic growth. How are we gonna come back stronger from this and give back based on what we've been through? The best interventions professionally for individuals that are suicide loss survivors. So again, if you're in a personal capacity and know that they need some kind of professional support, you want to try to get them into a support group, group therapy and individual therapy all at the same time. And again, at first that's a lot, so I wouldn't do that all at once. So I would refer them to an agency in your area that provides individual therapy and is familiar with um, 
DBT and CBT type of therapies they're called. So for those of you that aren't familiar, dialectical behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, they're known to be very successful in this context. And then one last takeaway, and you can share this with suicide loss survivors that you come across. It's in one of the books too. You know, when you first get a new plate, it's all one piece. No cracks, no scratches, nothing. It's perfect. Then one day, you know, you have an event that occurs. So in this case, a death by suicide, the, the plate falls, it breaks into pieces, right? As time goes on, you're slowly starting to try to, you know, get glue, glue the pieces back together from the broken plate, try to make it whole again. And in the end, the plate is whole, but there are still cracks, scratches, pieces left over. It's not exactly where it was. So we need to figure out how to become whole again, just in a different way, in a new way. And I'm not gonna do the case vignette, but you guys will have it to think about on your own time. I wanna leave the last 10 minutes that we have here flies for questions. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that, you know, everybody's gonna have that resource guide where there's books there, there's a podcast or actually two podcasts in there that I think are wonderful and then different um, resources. If you're not part of a county coalition for suicide prevention, I would definitely recommend that. I believe every, almost every county in Ohio has one. And I know there's some professionals like from um, Life After Loss that are here and they're wonderful support groups for individuals that are suicide loss survivors. So to keep those in mind too, but I would like to open it, take it back to Jessica to have any questions. Certainly. And thank you so much, Rebecca, for that very informative presentation and uh, for highlighting a few things and that I actually would speak to myself as you know uh, a protective factor for one um, for college students and so I think highlighting that was just something very vital for me also to um, mentioning that you know various populations that you're that suicide is increasing for example with African-American males and I believe there was a report from the Congressional Black Caucus, Ring the Alarm report, that specifically speaks to some of those statistics. So again, I just wanna thank you for pointing out those uh, key pieces, um, as well as pointing out um, the fact that, you know, even though we've heard during the pandemic that uh, there may have potentially been an increase in suicide, that the statistics actually, you know, do not support you know, that information that, that there, there has been an increase, but um, perhaps there may have been an increase in depression and anxiety and kind of some other areas um, versus suicide. So um, I do want to open it up to our audience. Um, please feel free um, to place any questions, any comments um, that you will have for Rebecca in, in our chat or Q&A function. Um, at, that would be the place. Um, and Rebecca, if you feel comfortable with kind of reading them and going through them, I'm okay with that as well. Well, I think Jessica, the first one that we got is actually for you because they're asking if um, they'll get the resources reference sent out to them. Yes, I do see that. Thank you so much for that question. So um, to answer that question, yes. And Rebecca did allude to that in her presentation. There will be a PDF of today's PowerPoint. That information will be disseminated out on our listserv. Uh, we will also have an edited version of this video uploaded to our YouTube channel. And I believe, Re Rebecca, you also have a reference sheet of resources um, that we will also disseminate out on our listserv. So yes, we will get that information out to our listserv. Say, so I could just briefly share right now so people know what to look out for the resource sheet and what's on it and go through it for a sec. So looking at, this is what you guys will be looking out for, resource list. There's quite a few books. I have personally read the first one, Life After Suicide, The Gift of Second, What Made Maddie Run, and 
there's actually this wonderful website by AFSP, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, that has a ton of different books for specific different types of suicide loss survivors. The thing to pay attention for, what made Maddie run, she is a person that, it's a true story, she was a college student who was a runner also, and eventually, unfortunately, did die by suicide. So if anybody wants that perspective, that's a specific book for that. Life After Suicide, those are actually individuals that were in public figure nationally. So if you want that kind of perspective. And then the one by Jason Holzer, he's actually, he wrote this um, from the perspective of when he lost his dad by suicide when Jason himself was 17 and he had a younger sister in school too. So depending on, you know, what you're looking for, those are some good specific ones that I've personally read and I like them. There's a few podcasts. Um, we actually had our other co-vice chair of the Summit County Suicide Prevention Coalition featured on the Men Who Talk Heal podcast. And then the Hope Illuminated podcast does have a very big focus on promoting hope and resilience um, in the realm of mental health and uh, death of somebody by suicide. And then of course, if you want one that I listened to that's specifically for a teen young adult, this is actually Jason Holzer again, that was the guest on this podcast. Lots of different websites that you guys can look through. Some of them are probably going to be very familiar. The Jed Foundation is one that we like to highlight. And then I believe somewhere I do have the Ring the Alarm report in here. So just kind of looking through all these things. I put the Portage County Suicide Prevention Coalition on here. The Summit County Suicide Prevention Coalition is on here. Anybody who wants to look at statistics, I did put that on there. And then I also just like to highlight some support groups that I'm aware of. A lot of people do want to know those just because they aren't always public knowledge. So ones that we know for kids, there is the one in Akron Children's, Light After Loss, which we have people in attendance from there, Stark County 13 plus. This one's in Portage County, the Kelly's Grief Center, which is adults only. The Grief Care Place in Stowe has one for adults, Cornerstone of Hope. And then the uh, survivors group that's in Summit County, that's survivors um, for adults only. So not as many for kids as adults, but they're still there. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you so much for, for sharing that information. I, I do have one, one question. Um, just thinking in terms of our audience being um, the majority of individuals from institutions of higher education in Ohio. And I'm not for certain if you would know this, but um, I'm not for certain either if there are, uh, let's say suicide prevention coalitions in every county in Ohio. But if let's say someone like student staff or faculty, if they were interested in getting involved in some of the advocacy work, um, that some of the suicide prevention coalitions um, do in counties, how and who would they contact to, to be involved with that, uh, a local suicide prevention coalition? That's a good question. And I feel like, just like a lot of things, every county's suicide prevention coalition is structured a little bit differently as far as A, how you can access them, and B, who's their main hub in a sense. Um, so I think your best bet, even though it does sound basic would be to just Google whatever county you're looking for suicide prevention coalition and figure that out that way. If it is Ohio specific, there is the Ohio suicide prevention foundation, which is one of the resources in that guide that everybody will get. And they should have a way to contact any coalition and the one closest to them if it so happens that their county doesn't specifically have one. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Any other questions or any final um final statements or, or thoughts you would want to share with the group, Rebecca? So I don't see any other questions. I see a few comments thanking me and I appreciate the thank yous. And, you know, anytime anybody wants to reach out, whether it's a professional or a personal capacity, my email is on things. Um, so just make sure you do reach out. I'm always open to ears and discussions, anything new. But I guess the final takeaway would be just to, you know, make sure everybody's in this together and there is hope and resilience in this. And like we said, we don't have to go down the other side of the fork. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you again, everyone, for your time and participating. Thank you. Thank you.